Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Somebody say amen. amen. Okay, let's do this a little bit, a little warm up. Can, can all of you say, God is good, God is good. All, the time, all the time, and all the time, all the time. God, is good. God is good. Give Him a shout in this house this morning. Yes, let's do this.
over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom, I speak Jesus. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is love. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows.
my phone because this is good stuff and I don't want to miss anything. Um, what's the condition of your heart today? Is it hardened from disappointments and devastation in the past? Or is it soft and full of God's love overflowing through you? You know, I have to admit, sometimes my heart's been both ways at times. Sometimes I've had stony places that God's had to help me transform it into flesh. It's a constant daily process. I've been reading in the chapter 36 of Ezekiel, and that was written by a priest who was called by God to prophesy the destruction of Israel and their rebellion. So I bet that was some good times. Um, but there was one verse that really stood out to me, and that was Ezekiel 36, 26. And it says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And you know, this is our promise from God that he can take our stubborn heart and turn it into flesh and, and get rid of our old hurts. You know, we've all experienced devastation, hurt, shame, bitterness, guilt. And these stones, what, you know, came to me, these stones keep us from allowing God to dwell in our heart. And so I'm asking you to pray with me this week and join me in the process of allowing God to have access to our hearts. Instead of letting hurts and stones take up space, let's let God dwell in our hearts so that we're overflowing with love and it flows upon other people. Let's pray. God, I want you to turn our hearts of stone into a heart of flesh. Give us the courage to approach you with confidence and trust you with all that we've stored up in our hearts. Heal our wounds and fill us more with you, Jesus. Fill our heart with your love and grace until it's overflowing. Let our hearts, our minds, and our ears be open to receive the message that Pastor Rick's prepared for us. We pray all these things in your name. And all God's people said, Amen. for Joe McElvaney. If he does not sink this putt, he will not move on to Sunday tournament play. However, losing today may not be the worst thing for Joe, considering his love of the game is outweighed by his love for going to church with his family on Sunday mornings. He's a true inspiration for all of us here on the tour. Although, if he's knocked out of the tournament today, the real tragedy won't be that another Sunday will go by without Joe McElvaney advancing to the final round on Sunday. No, the real tragedy is that another Sunday will go by without him inviting his best friend in the whole world to church. You know, you'd think, after all these years, that Joe would consider the fact that his buddy Steve may want to go to church to cleanse himself from his selfish, sinful heathenry. But enough about that. Joe's got a 12-footer to sink here. Do you want to go to church with us tomorrow? Yeah. Joe seems a bit distracted today. He really needs to make this putt, or he's gonna have to buy his pagan friend lunch. Miss it! Uh, invite someone, but not like that. Uh, I'm so proud of you. You're such a generous church. You give, and God blesses and uses what you give to have great ministry here in our own church and our community and also around the world. So thank you for that. So this is our time of giving. If you're giving today, there are buckets on either side of the stage to receive your gift. Maybe you want to set up online giving. There'll be some information about how you can do that. We'll give you a couple of minutes. God bless you. God loves a cheerful giver. People out 
out there Be hurt in some kind of love affair And how many times do you swear That you'd never love again How many lonely sleepless nights How many lies, how many fights So why would you want to put yourself Through all of that again Love is pain, I hear you say Love is a cruel and bitter way of pain You're back for all the faith you ever had in your brain hey. Or could it be that what you need the most Could leave you feeling just like a ghost You never want to feel so sad and lost again Or One day you could be looking Through an old book in rainy weather You see a picture of a smiling at you When you were still together You could be walking down the street And who should your chance to meet But that same old smile you've been thinking of all day mm-hmm. Why don't we turn the clock to zero, honey? I'll sell the stock, we'll spend all the money We're starting up a brand new day Turn the clock on the way back I wonder if she'll take me back I'm thinking in a brand new way so Turn the clock to zero, sister You'll never know how much I missed her I'm starting up a brand new Swim across it. We're starting up a brand new day. It could happen to you, just like it happened to me. A simple no immunity. There's no guarantee. I say, love is such a force. If you find yourself in it, babe, you need some time for reflection. You say, baby, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute, wait a minute Why don't we turn the clock to zero, honey I'll sell the stock, we'll spend all the money We're we'll starting up a brand new day Turn the clock to zero, Mac I'm begging her to take me back I'm, I'm freaking in a brand new day Turn the clock to zero, boss The river's wide, we'll swim across it Starting up a brand new Miscellaneous. Okay. Uh, so what what do we have left in the miscellaneous envelope? Nothing. Nothing. Where did it all go? I, diapers. Diaper. Since when does diaper money come Listen out? Listen up, you two. We need to talk about Easter. Honey, we would love to talk with you about Easter, but mommy I'm and daddy sick are sick of on you guys. Lucy, hi. Um, look, we know how important it is for you to invite our family and friends to Easter services. We've just been really busy lately. Okay, that's enough, big guy. Excuse you? Who are you inviting to Easter service? I need names, people! Okay. Have you been letting her listen to sermons in the minivan again? Uh, sweetie, can you please just get off the coffee table? Look, um, full transparency, uh, mom and dad don't really know how our friends would react if we asked them to go to church with us. People need the Lord. Really need a new halftime playlist. Mm -hmm. Jesus is going to be real sad. (sighs) You're right. People really do need Jesus. Clearly now more than ever. We'll come up with a list of names, okay? Daddy, please try to keep up. Well. No, no, not Chris from work. Yeah, Chris from work. Yeah. <gasps>
everyone who's watching online. We're so glad you're sharing your morning with us, and thank you for all of you who are here today. We continue in our series. We've been in it for 11 weeks now, and this is our next to the last message in the Old Testament book of Daniel. Daniel, my way or God's way? This is part 11. Our scripture today is taken from Daniel chapter 11, if you want to follow along in your Bible. Each week, you can download a study guide from our website at argyle.church. You can also watch previous messages on our website and also on YouTube and Facebook. So check us out there. Anybody remember the theme of the book of Daniel after 11 weeks? God is sovereign. Sovereign is not a word that we use a lot. Basically, that means God is in control. And we can read, we can study, we can meditate on prophecy in the scriptures. And that's a good thing for all of us to do. But ultimately, only God knows the future. So he gives us a glimpse of things to come. I think he does that to encourage us so, so that we can have hope in these difficult days. And that's why it's important to study prophecy. Since we know that God is sovereign, right? Since we know that God is in control, we know who holds the future. And that knowledge should give us hope. And that hope in God can change us from the inside out. That's what the scriptures say in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 3. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 11. And let him turn away from evil and do what is good. That's what hope in God does for us. And that's why we never put our trust in our own knowledge of prophecy. We put our trust in God and in God alone. We trust God to tell us the things that we need to know. We trust God to bring us real life change through Jesus from the inside out. And our faith is not a passive faith, but our faith is an active faith. And the more we know who God is, the stronger our faith grows. Daniel 11, verse 32. I love this verse. But the people who know their God will be strong and take action. Prophecy that is proven to be true is one of the ways that we know that the Scripture is the inspired Word of God. The number of fulfilled prophecies in the Scriptures is not only remarkable, it is supernatural. And the only one who knows all things is the one who reveals to us the things that we need to know. Daniel tells us in chapter 2, verse 22, God reveals the deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and light dwells with him. The first part of Daniel chapter 11 is talking about the prophecy in Daniel's day. This is prophecy that's already been fulfilled and is recorded in ancient history. The last part is prophecy about the Antichrist and the end times. And so we want to look at this text, not just as a history lesson, but we want to find some relevant spiritual truth that can equip us and encourage us to be the church every day, wherever we are. I believe the scriptures are the inspired word of God. I believe that God is omniscient, which means he knows everything. God knows the past. God knows the present. And yes, God knows the future. The book of Daniel is the inspired word of God, even though parts of it are difficult to understand. God wants to speak to me today. God wants to speak to you today through his word. The inspired book of Daniel. Angels played a part in sharing this truth with us. Daniel was faithful in writing it down. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, we now have the honor and the privilege to read it, to study it, 
and to interpret it. In chapter 11, we will look at four kingdoms, Medo, Persia, Greece, Egypt, and Syria. But Daniel's focus is always on how these kingdoms relate to the nation of Israel. Verse 1. In the first year of Darius the Mede, I stood up to strengthen and protect him. Now, Darius, I affectionately refer to as Hudi, and he's back in the news now. The angel Gabriel was speaking at the end of chapter 10, and he continues to speak as we transition into chapter 11. Gabriel was committed to strengthen and protect. He was committed to stand with the angel Michael in his battle against demonic forces. Gabriel is also encouraging Darius for his kindness to the Jewish people. See, it was Darius who gave the Jewish people their freedom from Babylonian captivity. I believe there is a special blessing from God to the nations who support Israel. The United States has been a faithful ally to Israel for many years. We need to hope and pray that that never changes. You see, we have a spiritual enemy who will never give up. And he is known as Satan. And he is a racist. He hates the Jewish people. His goal is to destroy Israel. And by the way, his goal is to destroy you and me. These are the prophecies about Persia and Greece. May God open our eyes to learn something to better love him and serve him. Verse 2. Now I will tell you the truth. Three more kings will arise in Persia and the fourth will be far richer than the others. By the power he gains through his riches he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. This fourth king is known as Xerxes. He invaded Greece but he lost the battle. Verse 3, then a warrior king will arise and he will rule a vast realm and do whatever he wants. This warrior king is known in history as Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great won many battles. That's why he was known as a great warrior. But Alexander's goal was not just to conquer all nations. His goal was to bring them together into one empire under his rule. Because of this, the Greek culture and the Greek language spread all over the region. And it happened because of Alexander. Because God is sovereign, God used Alexander to prepare the way for the spread of the gospel that would happen hundreds of years later. God is sovereign. Verse 4, But as soon as he is established... His kingdom will be broken up and divided to the four winds of heaven. God is sovereign. God is in control. God can even use ungodly nations and leaders to do his will. He used Persia and Greece to accomplish his purposes. It was Persia who God used to set Israel free from captivity. God's work will always be completed. Verse 4, but not to his descendants. It will not be the same kingdom that he ruled because his kingdom will be uprooted and will go to others besides them. As mighty as Alexander was, his reign did not last very long. Not many kingdoms experienced the greatness of Alexander's empire. You see, God is sovereign. Alexander was used to serve God's plan and purpose. And then his kingdom was divided into four pieces, it tells us. And God gave it to others as part of his divine plan. And then Alexander the Great died at the young age of 33. God gives kingdoms to leaders that he chooses. And God also takes kingdoms away. Verse 5. The king of the south will grow Powerful. The king of the south is the leader of Egypt. The king of the north is the leader of Syria. The small nation of Israel is sandwiched in between these two great powers. 
And there is continual conflict as leadership changes and changes and changes. The conflict between Egypt and Syria affects Israel. But that's why these two nations are important. It's always about the relationship with Israel. Verse 5. But one of his commanders will grow more powerful and will rule a kingdom greater than his. One of his commanders, Seleucus, defected to the kingdom of the north. There he grew in influence and power with the largest divisions of the Greek empire that included Babylonia, Syria, and Media. The king of the south died, and his son Philadelphus assumed the throne. It was Philadelphus who commissioned the translation of the Hebrew Bible into the Greek language. This is called the Septuagint. Once again, God uses another ungodly leader to accomplish his will and his purpose. God is sovereign. God is in control. Verse 6, After some years they will form an alliance, and the daughter of the king of the south will go to the king of the north and seal the agreement. Now notice what's happening here. It was common back in these days for kings and kingdoms to use marriage to secure a political agreement. Verse 6, she will not retain power and his strength will not endure. She will be given up together with her entourage, her father and the one who supported her during those times. See, we can see from this that this marriage agreement did not work. It only created a complicated web of trouble that would have made a great soap opera. You need to read this story. The king of the south demanded that Antiochus divorce his wife and marry the king's daughter, Berenice. But the divorced wife of Antiochus became full of rage, and so she murdered Antiochus, Berenice, and even their infant child. We see in this story that everyone does not live happily ever after. In the end, three people were murdered. Now, some of these details are not as interesting as this story, but the fulfillment of these prophecies is amazing. Verse 7, In the place of the king of the south, one from her family will rise up. The brother of the murdered daughter rose up he pledged to get revenge, and he would get revenge by conquering Syria. The trouble continues. Verse 7, Come against the army and enter the fortress of the king of the north. He will take action against them, and he will triumph. He will even take their gods captive to Egypt with their metal images and their precious articles of silver and gold. For some years he will stay away from the king of the north, who will enter the kingdom of the king of the south and then return to his own land. All through the rest of this chapter, conflict after conflict continues. Battle after battle keeps happening. Kings assume the throne. Kings are kicked off of their throne. Trouble continues between the kingdom of the south and the kingdom of the north. But notice that the human condition after all these years has not changed. They were messed up then, just like we're messed up now. The lust for power and the lust for wealth will drive people to do terrible things to each other. And that continues all through chapter 11. And it even continues today. Now a new leader comes on the scene. His brother was the king of the north. When his brother is murdered, he takes over the throne, even though it was not his throne to take. He would become the most cruel king of the north that ever lived. He was known as Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Antiochus IV Epiphanes is a type. He's a foreshadowing of the Antichrist who will come many, many years later in the last days. Verse 21. In his place, a despised person will arise. Royal honors will not be given to him. You see, this guy 
was a terrible person, a terrible leader. He was not in line to take the throne, so no honors were given to him. Verse 21, but he will come during a time of peace and seize the kingdom by intrigue. Notice, not by battles, not by fighting, but by intrigue. He will claim to be the one who brought the peace, but he is a deceiver and he is a liar. Verse 22, a flood of forces will be swept away before him. They will be broken as well as the covenant prince. In a battle with Egypt, the Egyptians will be defeated, and they were defeated in such a way that it seemed like a flood had washed them away. The prince of the covenant was murdered at the command of Antiochus. Verse 23, after an alliance is made with him, he will act deceitfully. He will rise to power with a small nation. Antiochus forms a fake alliance with the king of the south. Verse 24, during a time of peace, he will come into the richest parts of the province and do what his fathers and predecessors never did. He will come in friendship, but he has no intention to ever be their friend. Verse 24, he will lavish plunder, loot, wealth on his followers. He will make plans against fortified cities, but only for a time. Antiochus broke in and stole the Egyptian treasures. Then he uses those treasures to buy support from the people and to buy time to do his thing. Verse 25, with a large army, he will stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south. The king of the south will prepare for battle with an extremely large and powerful army, but he will not succeed because plots will be made against him. Those who eat his provisions will destroy him. His army will be swept away and many will fall slain. In other words, those who sat down at his table and ate with him will betray him and because of that betrayal, he will be defeated. Verse 27, the two kings whose hearts are bent on evil will speak lies at the same table but to no avail. The kings will meet, but because they are so evil, because they are liars and deceivers, nothing good comes from their meeting. Verse 27, for still the end will come at the appointed time. Did you remember that God is sovereign? That God is in control? And when God says, your time is up, your time is up. Verse 28, the king of the north will return to his land with great wealth, but his heart will be set against the holy covenant. He will take action, then return to his own land. As Antiochus was returning to his land to the north, he went through Israel, and as he went, he slaughtered every Jewish person he saw. 80,000 Jews were killed. 40,000 Jews were taken captive. And the temple in Jerusalem was defiled by Antiochus. Verse 29. At the appointed time, he will come again to the south, but this time will not be like the first. Antioch had attacked Egypt three times and failed. Verse 30. Ships of Kittim will come against him, and being intimidated, he will withdraw. Rome had sided with Egypt against Antiochus, and it was the Roman navy that made Antiochus retreat. So he decided to take out his anger on Israel. Verse 30, then he will rage against the holy covenant and take action. On his return, he will favor those who abandon the holy covenant. These are the Jews who became traitors to their own people against Israel. Verse 31, his forces will rise up and desecrate the temple fortress. Antiochus stopped all worship in the temple of God Jehovah. He defiled the temple by sacrificing a hog on the altar, and he set up a statue of the false god Zeus right in the temple. Verse 31, 
they will abolish the regular sacrifice and set up the abomination of desolation. This is just a glimpse of some of the things that the Antichrist will do in the last days. Verse 32, with flattery, he will corrupt those who act wickedly toward the covenant. Antiochus lied, and he promised to, re, to reward the Jewish people who would abandon their faith and follow Antiochus. This was a time of testing for the Jewish people. Would they turn their back on their faith when times get hard, and these were hard times? Or would they continue to stand for God? You might have heard of some Christians and even leaders and even preachers who have, after years, decided to leave the faith. The term they use is deconstruction. Deconstruction is the process of doubting, questioning, and eventually rejecting the teachings of the Christian faith. Most of the time when this happens, it's an attack from the enemy and not a genuine search for truth. Christians are commanded in Scripture that we must do our part to know what we believe and why we believe it. 2 Timothy 2.15 Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That is our responsibility as a Christ follower. And the best place for that to happen, guess what? Guess where? In a life group. In a life group doing life with other believers. Now the church should accept questions and doubts with the spirit of love and never with condemnation and judgment. Testing and trials. Difficult days. And even tragedy has a way of exposing what we really believe and don't believe. God's people in the book of Daniel had to choose my way or God's way. Verse 32, but the people who know their God, but the people who really know their God will be strong and take action. Those who intimately know God, those who have a personal relationship with him, they know who God is and what he's all about. Those who really know God will not deconstruct, but will be strong for God and will take action for his kingdom. What action will they take? To stand for the faith and to trust in the Lord with all your heart. But the people who know their God will be strong and take action. The people who really know God do not need to fear the last days, do not need to fear the end times. Since God is sovereign and God is in control, in faith we can pray from our heart to God, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. God, for the truth of your word, we thank you. Sometimes it's hard to figure out what you're saying, but your Holy Spirit helps us do that, and thank you for that. God, may something that we've talked about today change us from the inside out. If there's someone here who doesn't know you as Lord, would they confess their sin, repent, and accept your free gift of grace today? Thank you, God, that you have control over the future. And in, in you, we can trust with all our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. People matter to God, every single one of them. Jesus was born for people, lived for people, died for people, conquered sin and death for people. As we prepare to celebrate Easter, it's time to let people know this day is for them. This is our calling, our commission. The power of the resurrection has changed our lives, but it's not meant to stop there. The life-changing love of the cross, the unquenchable passion of the grave, the unbeatable power which rolled away the stone 
is meant to pierce the hearts of people. This Easter, don't keep it to yourself. Step out, reach out, speak out, and invite.